actually when Eric told me they are going to organize a workshop on low dimensional gravity, I didn't realize low dimension means three dimension. Three dimension usually is called higher dimensional gravity to me. <laughs> uh, so unfortunately, most part of today's technical talk will be on two dimensional gravity. But at the end, at the end of the talk, I will get some remarks or um, just uh, bring some some ideas about higher dimensional gravity, which is quite an unpredictable. Okay, and before I talk about uh, the details, let me first give a high level or very vague idea of what we are going to, what's the question we are going to, going to address today. So basically what, what we are going to talk about today is how to do a passing goal. Step. This is a larger passing goal in the sense that there is a larger factor multiplying the action. Uh, this kind of passing goal happens in many different places. This n could be number for flavor for your strongly interacting system. It could be one over junior ten in gravitational passing goal. It could be one over h bar in some single particle quantum mechanical system. Um, but the question is how to do that. And uh, the zeroth order answer is we just do saddle point plus fluctuation. That's like the most thing we could imagine uh, for doing a passing goal. Um, and it actually works very well in many different cases, especially in the past few years. Um, for example, understanding quantum chaos, understanding uh, black hole information paradox. And for most cases, the fluctuations near the saddle point for these larger passing goal is kind of simple because most modes near the saddle point will be largely gapped by this larger factor. And usually there are only several remaining soft modes you need to integrate over. So that's a zero sum order answer. Um, but the question we want to ask today, is that prescription enough? And uh, I think during the past few days, people have, have already argued it's uh, not enough for sure. For example, we learned from uh, SSS in JT gravity uh, or some older work in random matrix theory that we need to include some non-perturbative effect. Or sometimes people call it doubly non-perturbative effect. For example, the deep brain or eigenvalue instant time. Uh, today we are going to be um, a little bit mo more low broad than that. Let's just forget about all those non perturbative effects. Just view this passing goal as summing over different configuration of this five field. And then ask a saddle point plus uh, fluctuation putting that. And uh, the answer I'm going to give today is still no. And uh, that's what we are heading towards. So, so this is a plan for the talk. Um, actually, today we are basically going to focus on a uh, problem in semi-classical chaos, uh, especially two quantities there. One quantity is called OTOT, out of time order correlator. I will explain what the definition for that later. The other quantity is called spectral form factor. The reason why we focus on uh, semi-classical chaos today is because there are a lot of universality happen in this problem. And use those universality will be our ground truth. So our goal today is to do a passing to go such that you can reproduce those universal universal prediction from content. Oh sorry, uh classical so chaos. And for the first part of the talk, I will give a very brief, very rough uh review of saddle point collateral plus fluctuation works very well, the cases. And this first part will not be very self-contained. Uh, it will be very rough, uh, not rigorous. And the idea is to convey how we used to do the calculation. But in the second part, we are going to give one specific example uh, where this prescription is not enough. And this part is uh, based on actually an old paper that's uh, two years, less slightly less than three years ago. Um, it will be a calculation that is done in JT gravity. And uh, the reason why I choose the JT gravity as a concrete calculation is because that model is very well controlled nowadays. And in some sense, that calculation is not questionable. Like there's nothing uh, arguable there in the calculation. And after that, we are going to give some remarks, and there will be a lot of ambiguity, of rough here, whatever, in the remarks. Okay, so 
So now let's uh, let's begin the review. Uh, the cases where saddle point plus fluctuations is good enough. And the first example I'm going to talk about is this the auto order for the function. Uh, also. And this correlation function, if you want to write it down in a quantum field theory, it's defined, it's defined on the following Schrodinger Curtis contour. So the first draw the contour is on line. So in this contour, this direction is imaginary time. This direction is uh, real time, Lorentzian time. And this is a four point function. So we have four operator insertion. Uh, and so there's here, here, there, and there. And it is called out of time order because if you go on the contour, you can see you first encounter the early operator, then late operator, then early operator, then late operator. By the way, uh, this side and this side is identified. Okay, and uh, for semi-classical chaotic system, this quantity has a very universal behavior in four instance. So let me label this as OTOC as function of Lorentzian time, real time. That's good. better I just call this time T as, and this as far. And it has a universal behavior which at time equal to Zero, it starts with some final value that's normalized that to be one. And it first exponentially grows. Well, I guess from this diagram, it looks like it's going to be the case. But um, by exponential growth, I just mean the behavior for that is one minus e to the lambda lt, in which this lambda l is called the Lyapunov exponent. And for intermediate time, it's slightly unclear what's the universal behavior. At late enough time, it will exponentially decays with some uh, coefficient mu here. This has a name, sorry, this behavior has a name called quantinormal decay. And this mu here has a name called raw resin. And this is our ground truth. Now let's explain how passing will reproduce this result. And specifically, let's try to explain how passing how a uh, holographic system reproduce this result using gravitational passing. And as you can see, this four point function is computed on some uh, thermal space because we have finite Euclidean evolution. So the saddle point is nothing but a black hole. And the operators are inserted here, here, there, and there. This is our saddle point. And now the question is, what's the fluctuation near that? Or more carefully, what's the dominant or soft fluctuation around that saddle? And those fluctuations are given by the thing, uh, so-called shock wave. So what happens is um, this operator creates a local excitation, or actually called the method one uh, excitation near the horizon. In other words, if you write down the metric for this geometry, it looks like something this. So you have the original black hole metric, but you have some fraction near the horizon. For expert in the field, you will know I'm lying a little bit. Not really look like this, but more or less the same. So this U and V coordinates are the light beam coordinates. And U equal to zero and V equal to zero are this line, this is U equal to zero. This line is V equal to zero. 
So in other words, uh, the dominant fluctuation near the saddle point are just these two modes. And the strength of these two modes is described by these two strengths. Yes. They are very high energy. Give me five seconds. I will explain why it's soft mode. Right. So the question is, what's the contribution of this excitation to the action? And we can evaluate that by, by just putting this metric into the einstein hilbert And the, the action you will see is, um, we'll go over this two parameter, e to the i n x plus x minus. So this is expected at a leading order usually for that thing. But what's interesting is there is a e to the minus t factor here. e to the minus t is exactly coming from the high energy uh, system. And the reason why it's called a soft mode is because you can imagine all the other modes will be weighted by this n factor. So they are actually very high energy. But this mode, because of the high energy scan, or because of the near horizon boost symmetry, the energy gets boosted. So this mode becomes exponentially uh, soft. And uh, from quantum health, the relevant region here, gambling time, is when t is of order log. That's when this mode is, uh, is weighted by order one, for example. That's why it's called soft mode. Right. And uh, well, this is not a full computation because I just write down what the excitation and I need to, to compute the four point function. I need to um, compute how the four later coupled to it. And that, that is not a universal. Um, so let me just write it down as two functions here. So these two functions just describe how, um, for example, for x plus, let's call x plus as the strength of this shock wave. Then the psi of x plus just describes how this operator coupled to this mode. So basically you compute the two-point function of this two operator under the background of this factor. Again, this, uh, this two-wave function is not universal, so for different models, you will get different answers. But for specific cases where we know how to compute it, for example, BTZ black hole or um, JT gravity, we can derive the wave, uh, this, uh, this two point function. It roughly looks like something like this, uh, similar here. Minus. And this is just a two dimensional integral. You can do the integral, it gave you some hyperdimension, which nicely reproduces that. So, this is one thing that was very successful. It's a computation of OTOT. Another quantity in semi-classical chaos is called spectrum form factor. And this quantity is, oh, is this still working? Is this still working? I guess so. Yes, yes. Um, the other quantity is called spectrum form factor. And this quantity is defined by the following. So, um, So it's a, roughly speaking, it's just a Fourier transform of the level energy level level correlation. And uh, for technical reasons, sometimes it's uh, easier to like uh, to look at uh, the fixed energy version of that, where, well, roughly speaking, you just do a uh, inverse Laplace transformation to fix the average energy between them. And this figure version has a simpler formula, so it's literally just a Fourier transform of the density density correlation. And at this point, our universal 
prediction for uh, a classical chaotic system can come again. So this energy level level correlation function only depends on the symmetry class of your system. And for example, if you have Gaussian unitary ensemble, those are ensemble of, of Hamiltonians which don't have any symmetry. Then if you compute it, you will see the following behavior. For U, U, U. At early time, there is some non-universal decaying factor, but at late time, you will see a linear ramp. And at some point here, when T is of order the local density of state, it will plateau. Okay, this is again our ground truth. Um, I actually forgot to mention the reference. For this computer, was done by uh, Stanford. And uh, this is our ground truth. And the question we can ask is, how do we reproduce, for example, this behavior, this linear in T growth behavior? And this computation was done by Where it's also different. Well, by this uh, saddle plus plasturation prescription. And the saddle point is falling because we are computing uh, this this guy, which is roughly two part integer function. So you have two asymptotic ADS boundaries. And the saddle point is just a warm pole connection. This is a saddle. And the fluctuation for this configuration is just the relative width between these two bounds. You can imagine if you hold a cylinder and you do a relative width between these two boundaries, then this cylinder looks the same. So they have the same axis. So instead of a soft mode, it's actually a zero. And uh, the range of that width will give you a factor of t. That's the origin of that linear width. So these two are two examples uh, where saddle plus fluctuation works very well. And as our first part of the talk, this is actually heavy. Let me see how this. And now let's go to the second part of the talk where this prescription doesn't work well. And to give you an example, it's actually not very hard. We just go one order for further in this curve. Unfortunately, it's not enough to look at a Gaussian unitary ensemble because for Gaussian unitary ensemble, the function form of that cur curve is exact. It's the minimum of T draw B. So there's not a lot of uh, corrections you can look. It's just perfectly linear. But we can our life a little bit more colorful by going to a different ensemble called Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. That's when the Hamiltonian has some symmetry, for example, time reversal. And for that ensemble, compute the same k, k is the OE of T. The bit there is still some early time decay, which is not universal. Ramping behavior, but it's not a perfect line. And at some time it's still subtle. So we are not going to look at those at the moment. And for this ramping part, you have a leading order contribution, which is the same as DE. So it's a, I guess I use more. Um, so it's linear in T. But this curve also curving down a little bit. So it has a correction, which minus T for over rho. Okay, so that's our ground truth for Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. Yeah. Uh, you don't need to be a log loss still. Log log, uh, you, if you just can't, um, plot it directly, it's still 
Logalos field was for some uh bigger plot at least, not the <laughs> physical reason. Okay, um well there are of course other stuff. But uh our goal for the second part was just to reproduce this contribution in JT as a concrete example for many body cells. And before we go into the computation, let's mention several interesting features for the second part. The first interesting feature, well, the, the, the features, the three features I'm going to talk about is ordered by their level of uh, importance. So the first one is the least important. Oh, uh, yes, so everything on this blackboard is belonging to the set of plus value. Yeah. If you, you mean the plateau part, then it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, yeah, it's not. Before we, the remarks part, we are always, Focus on the region before this. Good. Uh, because that region, you need some more fancier stuff like B brains. And at the beginning of the talk, I gave a disclaimer. Today, we are not going to focus on those. And at, at the end of the talk, I will give some comment on that, uh, if that's okay. Okay, uh, so now let's comment on the features for the second fraction. The first feature is it's compressed by one over local density of state. And that's not very interesting. Actually, that's one of the easy features to reproduce in JP20. The second feature is it grows with T squared. Um, it's hard to explain why that's more interesting than the first feature, but we will see it in the calculation. But the third feature is apparently very weird. Is this minor sign? So the question is, how do you give a minor sign a path? Especially in the saddle plus fluctuation prescription. Because if you just keep the saddle, it will definitely get a positive number, or for the passive will just get a Um and one most naive thing you can imagine to give you a minor sign is if you have two unstable directions, then you need to do some weak rotation to make the pattern go well defined, then you get the minor sign. And let's see whether that's the case or not for, for this time. So now we can go to the computation in JT gravity. And uh, uh, I guess I need to explain something before that. No, nope, I don't. Now let's compute how to reproduce this term in JT. I guess in principle at this point I can just uh, start to write down the action for JT gravity and uh, explain how to quantize it, uh, to do a computation, blah blah. You know this, you will know this, but if you don't know this, that wouldn't help at all. Okay. <laughs> so instead of trying to start from scratch, what I'm trying to do is trying to And uh, the first thing we want to mention is for Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, or when you do the JT passing integral, you will allow non-orientable non surface in the box. So that's the first thing we need to mention. Surface is allowed. Okay, a second thing I want to mention is the density of, of state for JT gravity. It's not so important for today what the density of state really looks like, but the important thing is it's proportional to e to the S0. So this S0 plays the rule of N, the weighted by that. And why is that important? It's because in JT action, JT action, 
there is one term, which is basically the Gauss Bonnet term, which gives you a contribution to the partition that is proportional to e to the minus CGS number for the surface with two bounds, which is the case we are going to look at. So this, the first term is just linear in T. There's no one e to that not waiting. And easy to see for this term, g just equal to zero, which is consistent because the cylinder has g equal to zero. And now if you go to the second term, that rule seems to tell you the genus to be equal to one half. You have a surface with two boundary and genus equal to one half. We don't have any other choice. The only choice we have is a form. This is called a cross tab wormhole or wormhole with cross tab. I don't actually don't know what the technical name for it. Um, so you have two boundary here, but you have one extra thing here. And let me try to explain what this funny uh, notation means. And this funny notation means is if you imagine you look from up to down, okay. what this notation just means, this is a circle, but the antipodal points are identified. So this point is identified with that. This point is identified with that. Similar for other points. Um, and it, it also worth mentioning in JT path integral, uh, because it's a 2D variety, it's a topological variety. So first has uh, let's normalize it to be minus two. So it's a, uh, a hyperbolic with a fixed point. And that's the for JTS, as it gives you a topological variety. For this on the world. Second feature for this JT action, which I just mentioned, because the variety itself is topological, but there are still dynamical degree of freedom. And the dynamical degree of freedom just live on the boundary, asymptotic ADS boundary. It's an analog of this uh, boundary graph. Which in this case, it's called Swazi. And one nice thing for this mode is this mode is exact compatible. So um, actually for JGYF, you don't really need to rely on shadow time plus polarization. You can actually do the path into integral exact. Okay. Um, let's see. I think that's a, a pretty important feature for us to do the continuous computation. And uh, now I yeah, now I think it's uh, time to really do this computation. And the way to compute uh, the contribution from this geometry, topology is the following. So you imagine you cut this surface in the following way. You cut along a UDC, a closed UDC. Here, is that you said it's part of Cut along these two duty sticks. So this surface now becomes two parts. First part is asymptotic ADS. Asymptotic ADS. And end on a duty stick circle is length D1. That's the first part. The second part is a symmetric one from the right. Again, it has a asymptotic ADS. And, and here on a duty six is less than two. And in the middle, we have a surface as two duty six boundary. And it forms cap. And let's try to explain these two parts. One by one. This part, the only di here, and you can just compute it. The answer is equal to the following: so it's one over uh, 
By the way, I might make stack of two arrows from place to place. Again, with that. I think the answer is this. The asking party ADS2 has renormalized mass data, similar for that part. And for the middle part, the important information is this thing called a volume of the module space. The idea is even if we fix the geodesic lens D1 here and the geodesic lens D2 there, there are still many different surfaces who has those lenses. And the volume is basically counting how many surfaces are there with a specific measure. So that's called, that's called V minus equal to one half and with two boundary lines. And to compute that quantity in JT gravity, what we need to do is we just need to glue this three surface together along this red circle, that blue circle, with some specific measure. It's using that measure if you want to name. And for hyperbolic surface, this measure is very simple. It's basically just, basically just D1, D1, D2, D2. 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 Okay. Uh, yes, it's the one over square root four pi beta e to the n square root square root four. Uh, no, the beta is a boundary condition. Yeah. Okay, um, we're not ready. We have this wave function. The only thing is how do we compute this volume? Okay, that that is a little bit subtle, so I'm not going to explain why you should compute that way, but I will just try to explain the answer. Um, the answer is following. So you want to first parameterize different cross cap wormhole surface with fixed boundary. And the way to parameterize that is by looking at closed geodesics on this surface. So I hope I have another curve I do. So there are two of them, both like this. That's part A. That's one, both like this. And I believe you just go ahead and the integral over A and A prime with some uh, some range. However, that's uh, not actually true because on this surface, A and A prime are actually not independent if you say fix D1 and D2. So they are actually uh, related by the following condition. Change of A over four, change and the volume for that surface will just be a integration over one of those variables the a with a specific measure, which I will not explain where this measure comes from. But I will explain is the integration range here. The range here is fixed by, the, uh, sorry, the upper limit is fixed by a A star where A and A prime are equal. So A, a star satisfies sinh square A star over four equal to right hand side. And there is a lower cutoff, that's all. Um, this cutoff number is not very important in the sense that you can choose any number you want as long as it's small, but it's important you need a cutoff here. Otherwise, this interval doesn't make sense at all. Okay. And the result for this will be log hush. Okay, now we are really ready to do the computation. And I just follow the friction here. And since if you look up there, our boundary condition is actually beta plus IT and beta minus IT. 
if you see the, the time evolution. That means the wave function here, the boundary condition, we also need the analytical continue. So this one is beta plus it, that one. That one there is beta minus it. Okay, and I think we want to also see how I'm doing time. If we want to compute the fixed energy version of that, we now need to integral over the data, which is two pi data, a lot of compute to fix the over energy. And after doing that, we get the four integral, integral over D delta B. Delta B just denotes the into the I for root of E delta B. Oh, why did not see put one half for this surface? Right. So, yeah, good. Um, there are several different ways of explaining that, but the one way I, I will use is um, basically this Euler character is computing the, the area of this surface. Right. And you can imagine what this surface is. This surface is a four hole sphere. With Z2 quotient, right? And you and you can count to the Euler character for the total sphere divided by two. Okay, now we can do the computation. So, uh, are we? Yes, we are. Um, so there are one integration, two integration, three integration, and integration. And we can do the eta integral and integral over d1 plus d2. So you can imagine integral over d beta will give you some delta function and then you can integral over the, the sum of or average of d. And then you will remain with two integrals. One integral is the integral over the length difference. And this factor is just a reminiscent of this thing. Does that make sense? No question then, I guess it's good. <laughs> and there is a second factor, which is that. Okay, let's write on the results since I already did that. We get two log terms. Uh, the first log term has a d1 plus d2, and as I said, where the beta will fix d1 plus d2. So this term will just be a term that's proportional to t. The second term is log cosh of d1 plus d2 plus log f. Okay, this is our input. And at this point, we can try to do two different things. One thing we ultimately want to do is trying to do this integral using saddle points plus collaboration prescription. But before doing that, let's try to just first evaluate this integral exactly, okay? Because uh, in JT, we have this majority for doing the pass integral exactly. So let's try to do this pass integral exactly to check if we get the right answer. Then we do saddle point plus fluctuate or try to do saddle point plus fluctuation on this geometry to test if saddle point plus fluctuation is a good prescription or not. That's our logic for the next uh, 10 minutes. Okay, so first step, we just do this computation. Just compute this thing and check whether it works this way. Uh, leave action, yes, not factor, but sorry, I should do it. Unfortunately, I'm not going to explain how this factor comes from. You just have to have to, have to do this very easily. Okay, so um, before doing this integration, I can already explain why the second point here is a little bit more interesting than that. Because if you just look at that thing, so naively you would expect a, uh, sorry, I actually make another mistake. This is the torch. 
if you just naively look at uh, that integral, you would think the leading rows part is proportional to T2 instead of T4. Because you have a T4 here multiplying a log cosh. And for log T, log cosh is basically. So you would think the leading one is actually T2, not T4. But that's a funny part for this integral. Because you can deform the integration contour of uh, delta B. So originally contour is on the real axis. And since you have this exponential factor, you can try, try to deform the contour towards positive imaginary axis. And along that deformation, this term has no delta B dependent. So it actually goes away. This cutoff will also goes away. But this term, oh, sorry, I make it so many mistakes in this formula. This term, the log cosh delta b over four, this term has branch cut because the log. So in fact, it has branch cut when delta b is equal to two pi i. The first branch cut happens when delta b goes to put two pi plus some x. And you have a sequence of them. Uh, that that's uh, some reasonable because you put the delta b equal to y i plus that that cosh will be become pinch, and the log has a branch cut. But you have a uh, function that goes to zero and goes down. Okay, so in fact, when you do this computation, exactly only the second term. And what you have to do is you have to sum over all the contributions from different branch cuts. After this, you have another branch cut at delta b equal to 6 pi i plus x. And after that, you have another one, which is delta b equal to 10 pi i plus x. But the product periodicity for the top periodicity for the, for the, um, time. Okay. And after that, you will reproduce this result. I will not show, show that computation because it's not very uh, inspiring for topic we are going to. This, com this just uh, tells you that is the right time. What we can do is we are going to do that computation in a slightly different way, in a way that's matched with settle point plus plantation. So, yeah. Uh, sorry. <clears throat> which turn, which turn? Uh, yes, and that's basically zero. Yeah, for now, maybe there's not. Well, not for me as well, at, at least. Maybe for some other purpose, but not for me, yeah. Okay, so now let's try to do the to go in a different way. Erase the part. We, what we are going to do is we are going to restart from this step or one step before this. So we have uh, three integrals. Right. And we we'll go over the A from, from epsilon, A star. So we just stack up one step uh, for the integration over volume. And instead of trying to uh, do the computation exactly, we do a uh, variable transformation first. So the variable transformation is done by implementing that formula over there. That think a over four, think a prime over four equal to cosh cosh. Okay. Um, we want to implement that formula to exchange this delta b into a prime. That's what we are going to do. 
and uh, I will not go through the detail, but I will just write down the, the result. The result is a following for so that. Uh, well, actually, before I write down the result, I need to first explain one thing. So the goal is to use that formula. Let me actually copy that. But the uh, one subtlety here is uh, for which value of C we want to use that form. And uh, since our goal is to do semi classical computation, which should reproduce all results that is true in high energy, which means we are not supposed to reproduce C square over rho of E. In basic graphy, rho of E is some thing square root of E function. We are just going to reproduce the large energy limit of that. So we actually only need the information of the first branch term, the delta B equal to two pi plus that. So we are actually going to use this formula for delta B near the two pi plus that point. Okay. And after that, we will exchange this delta B into A prime. And uh, it turns out it's actually easier to write the integral in terms of things A and things A prime. So let, let me call this S, at the S, this one at the Y. And uh, the result you get will be something like this over, uh, okay. oh, sorry, so that's this, go over Bx, Dy, Exponential of minus raised to plus x. You'll get a function like this. And uh, this, the interesting part is not this we rewrite, but what's the integration rank for the capital X and capital Y? But the interesting thing is, if you remember our formula for computing this volume, this little a is cut off by some smaller value epsilon. So what that uh, indicates is, for this integral, actually, the x equals to zero and y equals to zero. It's actually cut it off from the integral. So in another word, if you translate into the geometry, you never allow this first step to be sort of degenerate along one of the side. That's one topological function. Okay. And why is that important? The reason why it's important is related to this third point, this minus sign. So let's just Look at this integral, dx, dy, e to the ix1. If you just do this integral along x real and y real, what will be the answer is that? Let's get one. Copy this one. Let's uh, get a integral one of them, you get a double function, so on, so on. But if you cut it out, a arbitrary small region, Near zero, what is the answer you are going to get? I think I guess. <laughs> I'm going to give it, give it a nice guess. What's this? Yeah, yeah. Yes, good. How to prove that? <laughs> so let's, uh, yeah, that's, uh, yes. <laughs> that's actually how people do research. <laughs> Okay, but we can prove that. Let's let's actually do that. The way to prove that is we insert the following factor, um, dx dy, x over x plus i epsilon, y over y plus i epsilon, equals i x one. 
And uh, with these two factors, it's uh, the fact that you cut it out, the x is the zero, y is the zero. Yes, the fact is the zero, this one is zero, y is the zero, that one is zero. And after you compute the answer, you take out the answer. That's it. That's it. That's it. No. You can check it. No. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> um, you always get the, you always, always. So, uh, yeah, it's very universal, but uh, it's also a subtle computation because uh, if you choose a minus epsilon, ISO, you would think, well, there are, you change the sign and the position of the pole, but you also, you also change the orientation of the uh, information comes to around the pole. So, actually, all the sign will cancel well. So, no matter what you use, you'll get mine. I can try. Uh, I think it's probably what like two digits. <laughs> I haven't tried. <laughs> we should, uh, yeah, I should try five for it. <laughs> so maybe maybe we'll have five years for the years. Ago. That's a good point. So I lied here. So originally, this integral is integral over dx, integral over dy from some part of epsilon to x. But uh, there is some, there is the A and A prime are symmetric. So this is like a quadrant of this uh, whole. And you just get a one factor of one over four and the X divide. That's how it comes. Okay. Uh, that's the end of the computation. The end of the computation is, uh, is it's the end of computation, but then not the end of second part, because now we are going to explain why do we do this. The reason why we do this computation is now you can check whether settle point plus fluctuation is a good prescription for this situation. If you look at the settle point for this interval, the settle point is at x equals zero and y equals zero. And the important thing in this computation is that subtle point is actually get cut it off by some topological constraint. If you don't do that, you will get the wrong sign in the first, in the future. So um, that's why here I said subtle plus fluctuation is not good. And uh, in this case, there's no fancy rebrains or non perturbative effect. It's just because the subtle point get cut it off by some something like this. And you would think, is this phenomenon just some weird phenomenon in this example, in this computation, in this specific term, or it appears somewhere else? You know, the answer is yes, it does appear somewhere else. And that translates into the third part, to the remote part. And let me see. Hi. Uh, yeah, let me summarize. So what we get is we explain that if you do saddle point plus soft mode, you will get plus p squared. And if you cut it out, the saddle point, but over the soft mode around it, you get minus. So that's always good. Thing. Okay. Uh, the cut off about energy. So, sorry, uh, you mean the this one? Yeah, that's the uh, that after that's the uh, cut off in the in the ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's being approximated. Yes, that's right. So uh, that's because we only try to do the computation with quantum computer. And we only get so, uh, the full quantum, com sorry, the full exact computation gave you think square root of E. We only get E to the square root of the computation. Which is the exact computation. Okay. Um, 
Okay, so uh, now we transfer into the third part, which is uh, random remark. Um, hope this is not recorded. Is this recorded? It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. So I haven't done that computation, but uh, presumably what you should do is you you mean reproduce it uh, in a similar platform. Yes. That's actually what happened in this computation. So what happened in this computation, perhaps you get a term which is like e to the uh, what minus square root of e, and you get second one is e to the minus three square root of e, and that's the extension for one over ten. Yeah. And presumably, if you want to do that way, maybe you should stand near the second branch, third branch, whatever, which I haven't done. <laughs> presumably. Okay, good. So now comes the remark part, which I will say something. Uh, it might be wrong. Probably is wrong. Uh, let's say <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. It's a. It's okay. It's a. It's supposed to be okay. <laughs> The first remark I want to make is are these phenomena happening in, uh, in other examples or other quantities, other systems? And the answer is yes. Uh, there are probably more examples, but the one example which I'm very familiar with is the subleading terms in OPOC computation. <clears throat> I will not go into the uh, technical detail, but I will try to explain what happens there. What happens there is there is this uh, interesting quantum uh, addict model called Brownian SYK model. So that model has a Hamiltonian which is time dependent, time dependent, time dependent in the way that uh, the random subplane is a Gaussian random model in time as well. So that's a full form manufacturer. And if you do this, do the out of time order computation in this model. If you, you again put it on some contour with operator insertion here and there, you'll get some answer. But the nice part of the universal ground truth for this model is we know this model at late time will convert to a hard random. So we actually know what the result at late time. What you do is you just replace this four here as hard random unitary and integral over the hard root. And you get an answer which is the four minus one over one, uh, L square minus one, some times on order one number, depends on the order. So there is again a minus sign. And uh, the explanation for the minus sign there is also related to some part of the Reason in the data uh, Actually, you can try to do a com computation in the system. This L here is a total Hilbert space dimension, so you can view that as an analog of each of that knot. Uh, one of the L square implies it's a computation on a disk with a handle, and if I analyze the soft mode there, the minus sign is coming from exactly the same. That's the first remark I want to make. Uh, the second remark. I want to make what is how we expect this uh, phenomenon or this computation to be generalized in harder uh, three dimensional is already harder, I guess. Uh, even three dimensional is not uh, In fact, I think the answer to me is not clear. I think Eric and the collaborators is making progress on that. Um, but I just want to explain why this question is not 
a simple question just generalizing the lesson from Lodi to every one paradigm. But there are some other physical questions. I'm going to explain that using a slightly different example because that example I completely don't know how to compute. I will use that. The other example, which is the computation of OG. So at the beginning of all, our talk, we explained that if you just want to reproduce the OGC, shadow plus um, this short wave, or this two specific pair of black agent, it's good. You can ask, is that true for higher dimensional strongly interacting point? That OGC is just described by the, uh, one pair of specific black agents. The answer is no. It's probably true for system that has a true gravity D. But in general, it's not for weakly coupled quantities. And let me try to explain a little bit why is that. The reason is because when we talk about this specific soft mode on the black hole geometry, we say there's two excitations. In the other horizon, you can ask, can we compute, do this computation using a more Connor 2 theory or a Feynman diagram? Well, because these are just gravitational factors. And the Connor 2 theory way of doing this computation is actually a sum over graviton H. So that actually equals two pairs of particles interact through graviton and two graphite strings, and da da da. Well, even in modern graphite. But the point is, that computation doesn't capture the fact, like, for example, loop track of graph. And you can ask, are these fractions important or not? And in fact, in gravity, these corrections are not important because some very miracle calculation of this design. But you can ask, are these contributions important for a weakly coupled from the field? And uh, to, to make sense of that word, I have to first explain what are graviton exchange in weakly coupled from the field. These graviton exchange are related with this thing called a form. And uh, this loop will be a part, a loop fraction to the part. And you can do this computation, just one loop contribution. This fluctuation can be very, very long, even compared to the leading. And uh, the intuition for that is, as we explained, the quantum, in quantum health, this mode are very strong. So this mode will grow in time exponentially. So this is a quantum field theory that is very weird. Like usually we look at a quantum field theory that doesn't grow. You know, growth maybe it's still part of But this one is like super, super higher than it. If you look at the long time behavior, it's one of the things. So what that for is in general, the fluctuation will be very, very strong. So the takeaway for this remark too is, I think generalizing everything we learn from low dimension to higher dimension. It's, it's not a trivial thing. There might be a bunch of them. Uh, okay, I will make one last remark and uh, we can, yeah. Yeah. So uh, you can do it either way. In the box, what happens is Two pairs of particle lines, which basically um, related with this two pairs of particles, and these are squared. The and you can view this diagram as in the boundary as well. Okay. So you, on the boundary, you still have four insertions. And now um, this single one diagram is actually already resolved. So this particle here is not a fundamental particle in the boundary, boundary quantum field, but it's some collective field. And the name, name for the selective field is called pop. Yeah. 
Tak. Uh, well, when you say that statement, you are already assuming that our boundary functional field has a two gravity. The subtlety I mentioned here is in general for all interaction functions. So you can have a one plus one D functional field theory which don't have a two gravity. Like where we couple the uh, host coupling is very small, in the block it's a very springy. Uh, okay. So the last remark we had for lunch, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good. So one of the example, which is non ladder diagram, is like this. This is not a ladder diagram. And in one plus one D, we actually have analyzed that with uh, the uh, with bug line material. So what happened is the following. Um, if you make a, this is now the space time diagram. So this is time direction. This is that. This is separate. And you, if you make a local perturbation here, and if you just include the, the single polymer chain, what you expect is a butterfly structure. The butterfly cone is defined by a butterfly. Okay, two point five, two point seven, whatever. And now you can compute the the size of this size, and you, what you can see is it's become even larger than single polymer before the naive butterfly. So, um, in, that that's what happened in like VC public property. So that's why I say this. Diagram will sort of break the ladder resummation uh, because you will have other fractions that are more important than your ladder. Uh, okay, one last remark. One last remark is about the, the puzzle, uh, which, uh, which is, which I completely don't know. So the existing thing for the plateau physics, the plateau physics, I just mean the transition from linear to constant, like this here. The existing uh, understanding for plateau physics, uh, at least for example in JT gravity or in uh, something called the order object theory, as you have to use this determinant trick or introduce some DD. Um, but the question is if we are just a low overall quantum field theory person or quantum mechanics person, why do we introduce those contributions in the first place? Why can't we just sum over all possible configurations and uh, get this to that? And uh, the answer is unknown, um, at least unknown for me. Um, but uh, one interesting thing is. We can try to do a computation to capture part of this thing, to plus of this thing. And uh, that computation can only capture part of term in the canonical ensemble stuff of all. So what happens is the following if you draw the canonical spectral form factor, the canonical uh uh sorry, canonical actually it is but by uh by spectral form factor in canonical ensemble, I just mean you don't take to a anything. And for that spectral form factor, actually you do see fractions uh, on top of D minus T. For example, you get a piece which is linear in T, and you get a second piece which is C T over C to T F one. Plus, blah, 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 blah. And you can ask whether or not we can um, reduce these terms. In the uh, in a passenger computation, and in fact that's very subtle. The reason why it's subtle is if you look at higher order terms, for example, the term which comes from the D surface, it's all like t to the t d plus one over 
you can see that part. This one is perfect part. We got some coefficient, order one coefficient multiplied by one. But as this order is equal to the assault expansion, you can get some terms that is very, very subleading in T. For example, it's just draw linear T. But it could have a huge coefficient here. A huge coefficient that goes like two digits. So if you just do this computation faithfully in JGW, you wouldn't get a convergence view. You will get a asymptotic view. And that's related with this one identity interest. But uh, what you can try to do is instead just try to reproduce the first step. You're leading in T to a step by each order. Each of that and that can be done. Um, but uh, unfortunately, that computation doesn't force me to any category in the first step. It's not controlled by side by plus black like, 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 like. That's still an open question as far as I know. And that's all I want to talk about today. Thank you for asking that. You, you give me another chance to talk different topics. <laughs> if people get hungry, please send. Okay, I don't know how long this is. Right, so, um, yeah, so there is a technique in semi classical quantum health to compute all these subleading questions, especially the minus p square over rho. And that uh, theory is called periodic orbit. And let me try to give a brief intu in, uh, intuition of what that theory is doing, and uh, then explain the, the relation um, between the computation we just did in JT gravity and that computation. Um, what you are going to see is JT gravity is, is exactly the same as a periodic orbit. That's what I don't know. So periodic orbit theory has a very simple idea. The idea is you just imagine your system is sort of propagating on the phase space. Okay? So you just have some action you want to compute for the partition function, the due time evolution. Okay. Just imagine the partition function with due time evolution as some particle propagating in your phase space. And for the quantity we are computing today, you have two steps. You have V of IT and basically a time reversal of that, V of minus one. Okay. So instead of just one circle object, you can have another one. Over here. And in general, this, the contribution from these two objects is multiplied together. It won't be very important because it's highly oscillated because of the phase. And uh, the first term that you would think uh, no oscillation when these two orbits overlap with each other. So you will have this composition. Basically, one orbit, the blue one, just follow closely with the white one. And since they are basically coming with of each other, they oscillate in phase, they are together complex hot conjugate for the cancel. And this is called a um, barrier diagonal of hot. And in JT graphic language, Wompel, we talked about that. Okay. And uh, the subleading part. 
in the other order theory is the following. So you can imagine instead of asking these two orders to follow each other closely, you allow them to meet together then deviate. Uh, more precisely, now, now I'm creating a bigger space. Okay. You can have a convergence configuration like this. One orbit being this. So for most part or most amount of time they follow each other closely. But in some small region here, they sort of change parking. So originally this guy and that guy are close, let's call it orbit one, two, three, four. Originally one, two are close, three, four are close. After this region, four become close to two. One become close to three. And this thing has a name called encounter. And the reason why this could also give you a non zero contribution is because or, um, originally we want the phase to be completely cancelled. But now in this case, for most part of the phase cancels with each other. But there is this small region give you slightly a little bit non cancelling contribution. And uh, that phase is all the one phase. So that's fine. Um, and the claim. I'm going to make is this one is a, exactly the same as this cross tab room pool we look at. To justify this thing, well, we can do computation to justify this thing. But I will just try to draw several pictures to justify this thing. Uh, I think I need a larger graphic. Well. We'll go is to show this guy and that guy. And I will just do that by those pictures. The way to do that is let's first try to draw cross type wormhole in embedding. So the the claim for 2D, sorry, the property for 2D hyperbolic linear surface is you can always embed it that into a hyperbolic disk with some cosine. So what's the embedding space picture for that cross type wormhole is the following. So you you can now for pieces. Of your hyperbolic disk, you identify this this edge with that edge with a reverse orientation. That one with that side with a reverse orientation. Uh, so this coming to this is a cross half one Yes, I know. Ah, it's not okay. Let's just let's uh, see topologically why that true. That is true it's because the if you just have a cross tab it itself, it's basically a circle you identify with and that. And to make it a wormhole, you just put two circles on this surface. And let's try to move this circle towards that head so that it becomes this one and that one. And you move this circle to that head, so it becomes this one or that one. And you identify this head with that head, this head with that head. That's the broadly why this is a cross tab one. And on this surface, if we draw what what are the D1 and D2 U and D2 cycles, just I use the I used to use the red and blue line. So D1 cycle is this side, D2 cycle is this side. And in our computation. We can see the D1 and D2 cycle actually the length of them still with T. So for late time, the length of the red circle and blue circle cycle is actually very big. And we just explained the uh sorry, we, we did. And we can compute the area of the surface that is enclosed by this blue line, red line, and this one at an space using which is just cost connected. So it's equal to some constant number. And if you want to you can imagine you have a whatever um, surface and you want to make the length of the edge to be huge while keep the surface area the same. What you have to do is you have to make that surface very thin. And that's what happens here. Actually, what in our case, what this surface looks like is a form. Right? 
Yes. 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 And we want to identify it. This X, this that X, this X, and that X. Okay. Now let's do a flip here. Let's rotate this half of the picture. Okay. So what we get? Four. This is two. Blue. This is two over blue. It fits it with the middle part. We get red going this way, that's why it's going this way. And I think we fit it, so the identification orientation also changed a little bit. This two are the same. But this end used to be like that. And you fit it, so this. That's why it used to be that one. And you fit it. Uh, and this is this one. So you just do this at home for paper. Okay. Okay, I know. That's the other two guys. And this is not just our. our in, in fact, all of these, you can make it uh, mathematically. Uh, 